V has come too. 1998 was a monumental year for the gaming industry, with many soon-to-be iconic and legendary games releasing across most platforms that year. Games like Half-Life and StarCraft on PC, Metal Gear Solid and Spyro the Dragon on PlayStation, and Ocarina of Time and Banjo-Kazooie on the N64. But while every other platform was celebrating and flowing with hits, the Sega Saturn kind of sat alone in the corner of the party, just waiting for it all to end. And leave the rest of the world behind. <laughs> to keep a long story short, the Saturn had a very hard life, and never saw the same success as its competition, or even its predecessor, the Sega Genesis, especially outside of Japan. But it didn't stop Sega and their studios from creating otherwise impressive and experimental early 3D games for the system. Chris to all Rangers, the energy core temperature is reaching dangerous levels. Reports confirm that workers are still trapped inside. Rangers report to the emergency staging area for immediate transport. Burning Rangers is an action platformer released on the Sega Saturn in the spring of 1998, only several months before the console's official discontinuation, and thus one of the final games released on the platform. I chose to do this game because I was, am, is a longtime fan of Sonic the Hedgehog, and Burning Rangers is one of the few games from Sonic Team that I never got the chance to play. Burning Rangers began development in late 1996, right after work on Christmas nights had ended. In an interview with Sega Saturn Magazine, the development team stated that their goal was to create a game where saving people was the sole objective, rather than killing them like in other action games. The game takes place in a sort of utopian future where crime and poverty have been solved completely, and the only problems humanity deals with are natural disasters, the most common of which are fires. The Burning Rangers are a group of futuristic firefighters whose job is to, well, be firefighters, putting out the flames and rescuing civilians all over the world. There's Chris Parton, supervisor of the Rangers and also your navigator, Lead Phoenix, the calm and collected leader of the team on away missions, Big the Cat, uh, I mean, Big Landman, the oldest and most experienced member of the team. Just like in Knights, Burning Rangers has two playable characters, both being a boy and a girl. In this case, Sho and Tillis, who are both new recruits. Though unlike Knights, the campaign is still the same regardless of who you play as. The Sega Saturn excelled at pushing out high quality looking 2D games, but when it came to 3D, it was a mixed bag. While many third party developers struggled to get the most out of the Saturn's confusing hardware, Sonic Team attempted to push things to its absolute limit with Burning Rangers. The choice of using fire wasn't purely thematic and cosmetic, it was a challenge. Things like fire and water, two objects that aren't solid and can take many forms, have always been difficult to make look convincing, either in 2D or in 3D. With the theme of firefighting, the developers wanted to not only provide a unique form of gameplay, but to also show off what the system was capable of at its highest potential. The fires in the game look incredibly detailed and were achieved through constant experimenting by taking blocky 2D sprites and tweaking them with various transparency effects, animation, and lighting to get the look just right. The primary focus of the game is putting out the flames all around you and keeping the danger levels as low as possible, as represented by a graph at the top right of the screen. There's different kinds of flames, each having different colors and functions. Orange fires are the standard. Blue fires require a charged shot to get rid of. Green fires spew out smaller fireballs. And then there's the pink flames, which I have absolutely no idea what they do. Putting out the fires not only decrease the danger level, but they also generate crystals, which are used for two things, maintaining your shields and rescuing people. Burning Ranger's health system, almost unsurprisingly, works exactly like Sonic the Hedgehog's. If you take a hit, you lose all your crystals, but if you take a hit while having no crystals, you die. Ah! 
In order to rescue people, you need to have at least 5 crystals, and if you rescue them with 10 or more, then you can get an extra continue. It's also worth mentioning that rescuing also functions as a sort of checkpoint if you die, so it's important to do it whenever you get the chance. Despite these limitations, thankfully crystals are all over the place, so it was actually quite rare that I never had enough on hand to pick up civilians. There was only one incident that I can think of where I didn't have enough, which was a little annoying because it forced me to backtrack through the level. Being an early 3D game from a time where controls in 3D games weren't yet standardized, Burning Rangers unsurprisingly has some awkward controls. Movement is done entirely on the D-pad, while changing the camera angles is done with the L and R buttons. As I'm playing this on an emulator with the 360 controller, I had to get a bit creative with how I mapped the buttons. Sonic Team really tried their best to make movement not a complete chore, but they could only do so much with the hardware that they were given. What's really interesting though about Burning Rangers is that despite how complicated and convoluted the level design is, it doesn't actually have a map. In any other game, this would be a tremendously huge drawback, but here it works flawlessly because of one special feature, the communicator. While sometimes Chris will tell you where to go automatically, the point is to use it whenever you want by pressing the X or Z buttons on the controller and to receive directions based on your relative position. And shockingly, it works. It works. Some lines will be pretty basic, like turn around or go left, but sometimes you'll get something a bit more complicated. This is Tillis! Keep moving forward. This is Tillis! In front of you and towards the right. Chris! No data available here. Proceed with caution. Honestly, I think this approach works far, far better than a simple map because instead of having the player open up a map and scramble to figure out what to do next while also under the pressure of being in an environment where everything is burning around them, all they have to do is press a button, get the directions, and it's done. Regardless of the quality of the game, Sonic Team was always known for going the extra mile and bringing a high quality soundtrack. But weirdly enough, the soundtrack of Burning Rangers actually takes a back seat during the gameplay. Aside from the menus and a few cutscenes, there's no music in-game, and this is mainly because you'll need to pay attention to the audio cues, not just from the voice communicator, but from warning sounds when explosions are about to happen. There are four missions in the game, and each has the same basic structure. Navigate through a maze-like facility, put out flames, rescue people, and then fight a boss at the end. My first go through the very first stage was kind of a mess because despite how patronizing the tutorial is, it leaves out some important details like swimming controls and explaining the concept of danger levels, both of which I had to read the manual to figure out. Later playthroughs however were far less rocky and that was where the game's mechanics really started to click with me. What I also really think drives home the saving people aspect of the game is that you can receive mail from those that you rescued. It's simple stuff like people thanking you and telling you what they plan on doing with their lives, but it's a nice touch, and I'm glad Sonic Theme thought ahead enough to add in little details like this. Unfortunately, Burning Rangers is a really front-loaded game, as the quality starts dipping and spiraling all over the place after missions 3 and 4, but mainly in mission 4. Mission 3 is kind of a tough pill to swallow, with larger robots that have far too much health and Hazards that have no warning cues on top of being longer and a little more tedious than the previous two missions, but it's a passable stage. Mission 4, however, is where things get really, really, really out of hand. I need to get out of here. Watch out! Ah! There's that voice again! Look out! I'm not sure if I'd call it a bad level, but it's one that feels like a bunch of ideas haphazardly slapped together at the last minute. Why am I platforming on narrow blocks in some weird, surreal dream world? Why am I in some ancient ruins when I'm supposed to be on a spaceship? What, what happened to just being a firefighter? I don't know. It doesn't help that the mission itself is significantly harder than anything else before it, with the final boss, who is unfairly difficult, being a harsh punchline to this otherwise sick joke of a level. 
There's three phases to this boss. The first two are pretty manageable and kind of easy, but the real kick in the groin is the final third phase, where it turns into some sort of monster, demon, creature thing. In order to do damage on the boss, you have to destroy these giant circle things that can regenerate pretty quickly, almost a little too quickly. Adding more pressure to the boss is the fact that aiming your charged shots is, for some reason, far, far harder in this single boss fight than at any point in the game for whatever reason. Overall, the game has some really intensely reliable auto-aim, which is really good because otherwise it would have been annoying to try to put out fires in previous missions, but for some weird-ass reason, the auto-aim decides to just not be reliable. For example, Notice how shooting right in front of the circle thing makes me miss it completely, but shooting it about a meter to the left does. And to pour even more salt onto the wound, the boss fight itself is drawn out and tedious with the boss moving back and forth across the arena each time you get a hit. I'll admit that I did actually cheat for this boss, but only because he's a cheating bastard anyways. After that, the game's beaten and the credits roll, but it's not entirely over yet. After you beat the game, you unlock the password system, which allows you to revisit previous iterations of the missions, but also play as other members of the team. More importantly, you unlock the random level generator, which changes around the placement of enemies, civilians, switches, and much more each time you play. At release, a lot of reviews complained about the short length of the game, which is technically true, but it kind of ignored the fact that the game itself encourages you to go back and replay it to get a better score and grade, something that's been a staple of Sonic Team's games for a very long time. In conclusion, Burning Rangers isn't a perfect game, but it deserved a far better fate than what it had gotten. Unlike other first-party games released late in the system's lifespan, Burning Rangers got very little publicity and copies sent to stores, especially outside of Japan where copies were the most scarce, as the Saturn was pretty much all but ignored by that point in America. Burning Rangers was also in development parallel to Sonic Adventure and Shenmue, two major games that started development on the Saturn in 1996 but moved to the Dreamcast in 97 when the console was entering early production. I think Burning Rangers is a game that should have also moved to the Dreamcast like the others, not just because it would have gotten more exposure but also because the much better hardware would have fixed a lot of the technical issues the game had. Even though Burning Rangers may have been overlooked, the game and much of its concepts continued to live on in other ways. The plot of Mission 4 of stopping the space station from crashing into Earth reminds me a lot of the last story portion of Sonic Adventure 2, and the idea for randomized objectives also carried over into Knuckles and Rouge's stages. The boss of Mission 3 served as the basis for the Egg Dragoon in Sonic Unleashed, and there's even a track in Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transform that's loosely based off the second mission. Of all of Sega's franchises that fans beg to be revitalized, I think Burning Rangers is the one that deserves it the most, because out of all of these franchises, I think it had the most unrealized potential. Its problems weren't because of bad ideas or bad implementation, but simply the system that they had to work with not being up to the task, and also it not having the audience to bring sales. I'm not exactly holding my breath for a remaster, since most of Sega's games on the Saturn, aside from Nights in the Dreams, have never seen a proper re-release for a variety of reasons. But, it'd be nice.